My favorite thing about doing unboxings, it's the mystery of it. I don't know what I'm going to get when I open up this box. And it's that initial first, whoa, what is this? Like reaction to whatever it, the box may hold. It's the mystery of it. It's, uh, it's the unknown. Okay, first box time. You may be about to have a bout of deja vu. What? What? Look at this guy. I, I was given a bunch of research to study up on and review in preparation for this, and I think I know what's going on. I, we're doing another edition of gemstones that you may not, probably have not heard of before. And we're kicking things off with Brazilianite. Brazilianite is a really exceptional collector's stone because it is very rare. It mainly occurs in Brazil, which is where it gets its name. It's not the softest, but it's not the hardest either. It's about a five and a half on the most scale. And it's also exceedingly rare to find specimens larger than 10 carats. So the fact that we have one of this size today is really special. And I love the green kind of with a, a little splash of yellow thrown in. That's a that's a really great color. And I also love all of these uh, naturally occurring faces that it has up near the, the termination point. This guy, like many fine gemstones out of Brazil, comes from Minas Gerais. You may know that locale for the Paraíba tourmaline, very famous electric blue gemstone that comes out of there. A word of caution about this guy, if you are lucky enough to have Brazilianite in your collection, don't put it in a 300 degree oven, okay? Don't cook it in there with your brownies because this guy will lose its color at about 284 Fahrenheit. You know, good rule of thumb, don't bake your gemstones. I, you got no reason to toss them in your oven. Most Brazilianite is kept in its rough form. It's a little bit difficult to facet because it has perfect cleavage. So most rough Brazilianite is just kept how it is. And I'm glad this was kept how it is because I mean, look at this formation. On to the next? Yeah. All right, let's go, we're cruising. Whoa, I love. Wow, holy. Look at this radial formation, dude. It looks insane. It looks like the cross section of an alien tree. And this is scolocyte and it's actually on chalcedony. I love the color and like texture juxtaposition between the bright red and white uh, scolocyte radiating out and then like the soft sort of bubbly couscous look <laughs> of the chalcedony. Scolocyte gets its name from the Greek word scolex, which means worm, because when you introduce scolocyte to fire, it actually wriggles and writhes like a worm. Those Greeks were doing crazy things with rocks, dude. <laughs> like tourmaline, this guy is actually piezoelectric. It, it has a property where it can actually be charged. It can be polarized, so positive at one end and negative on the other, just like tourmaline. So scolocyte is actually a type of zeolite, which is a hydrated aluminosilicate mineral, and it's reversibly dehydratable, which basically means it, it can take water and discard water and take it over and over again, which means it's very useful for industrial applications as well as um, products that you might find in your own household, you know, underneath your kitchen sink or something like that. Unfortunately, very soft and very brittle, so it's a no-go for jewelry, but when it looks this exceptional in its rough form, I don't really think it needs to be mounted in silver. Really cool stuff. Awesome specimen. This guy is shocking to look at, man. Next box. This one's a little bit heavier than the other ones. Whoop. Whoa, oh, look at this guy. Hey, okay, so similar shape, similar features. This is Wavelite. It was discovered in Devon, England and named after the man who discovered it himself. Last name Wavell. He was a botanist, physician, naturalist, and he helped introduce it to the mineralogical world. So this guy is in Matrix, but I can kind of see, it, I feel like if it weren't in Matrix, I could see a little bit through it. Wavellite tends to be translucent and it can come in a variety of colors. It can be blue, green, yellow, and white, which I actually, I think I see all of those colors. White in the center, green, a little bit of blue, and the green is a bit yellow as well. So we, we sort of have the whole spectrum of Wavellite wavelengths, if you will. A, a very popular locale for Wavellite is uh, Arkansas, and that's where this guy comes from specifically Mount Ida in Arkansas in the Wachita Mountains, way out west. 
Arkansas produces a lot of really cool gemstones and wavelight is, uh, is definitely one of them. So this wavelite is emblematic of the most famous formation of wavelite. This pinwheel radiating thing, kind of like, kind of like our buddy over here. It can fluoresce under shortwave and longwave light. Shortwave light will yield a kind of soft sky blue color. And the long wave light tends to be the same color, but just a lot stronger reaction. This guy is only a three and a half on the most hardness scale. So if you do have some in your collection, leave it be, try and touch it as little as possible. But we love it. It looks so cool. You should definitely have some if you are a mineral collector or a gemstone collector. Box number four. What is this? Hee <laughs> hee. What are you guys making me do here? These guys are mimetite, which is a lead arsenate, which are two words you don't ever really want to encounter back to back. But that's why we've got gloves on, uh, and I will be washing my hands before I put them anywhere near my face or in my mouth after handling these guys, because they are a little bit toxic. These guys in particular belong to the appetite group. The bigger yellow one comes from Durango, Mexico. So it forms in a series with vanadinite and pyromorphite, and it actually gets its name from the Greek word for imitator because of its appearance, uh, its similarity to pyromorphite. These guys often form in one of my favorite crystal habits, the botryoidal crystal habit, which is just sort of spherical, big cauliflower head looking thing. Most mimetite is not faceted. Uh, frankly, because it's toxic. And also, I wouldn't want to facet either of these guys because they look really great on their own, uh, just in the natural state that they come out of the ground in. So, Mimetite, have it on your list. Maybe have it behind glass. <laughs> Next box, what do we got? Whoa, hey, this is a different color. We haven't seen this color yet. This is Broken Tite, which was named after a French man by the name of André Jean Francois Marie Brocan de Villiers. Oh, look at these little neat. Okay, I'm going to handle this a little bit less because I'm noticing really, really, really fine needles in the uh, in the corner. I'm not worried for myself. I'm worried for the specimen. When it's acicular in its formation, it can actually be pretty easily confused with dioptase. At first glance, with the color of it, I thought it was dioptase, and it's often confused for dioptase, but it's got these really fine radiating needles down here at the front of the specimen. The color bears an uncanny resemblance to dioptase. This is actually a secondary copper mineral, and it, it can be found uh, in lots of copper mines. It occurs very rarely in crystals, and if it does, it's they're prismatic and tabular. There might be some really small crystals that I can't make out the shape of with my naked eye, but uh, the, nonetheless, this guy is really cool. It can actually be a pseudomorph after azurite or malachite. Next, specimen. What do we got? Wow, I'm gonna talk about blue. Oh my goodness. Look at that, that didn't even look real. That is such an unnatural color to occur in the natural world. I just love naturally, vibrantly puke blue things. It just looks so nutty. Little Kinoite specimen we got here today. There's like this vague, almost pyrite looking glitter to it in amongst the Kinoite on this matrix. It looks like it's just a flat blue sort of splash of paint but there's actually a little bit of a metallic sparkle in here. So Kinoite actually has a pretty interesting backstory as far as its name origins go. It's named after an Italian Jesuit priest named Eusebio Francisco Kino, and he made about 40 expositions to Arizona and helped the local Native Americans diversify their agriculture, and he was just kind of a general ally of theirs in conflicts with other Indian tribes. We took a little bit of a risk handling this guy, and I actually, I handled it very delicately with my little pinchers because it is only a two and a half on the Mohs scale of hardness. The blue color of it is just too dramatic to pass up. I, we, we had to include it in this little collection today. Another cool thing about this guy is that it comes from the Christmas mine in Gila County, Arizona. And the mine is called Christmas Mine because it was staked on Christmas Day, 1902, sort of like a last minute moving of the mine. It was the development of the mine that allowed the development of the town 
around it, and people for decades after, while the while the mine uh, was still in operation, would uh, come down to get postcards to send to their family and says, hello from Christmas, you know, so. I'm being told this is our last box, so I'm gonna really relish this. <gasps> what? You look like you're made out of particle board. Okay, I gotta be delicate with this. It literally looks like it's made out of wood, man. So this guy is very, very soft. It looks like it maybe it looks like maybe it has the texture of mushrooms. You know what I mean? Like white mushrooms. This is tincalconite. This guy's name comes from the Sanskrit word tincal for borax. And the ancient Greek word for powder, which is conus. So tincalcoite. So this guy comes from Kern County. California, commonly seen in borax deposits in Southern California where it grows or it forms as a coating on kernite and borax down there, both of which can actually alter to this in dry enough conditions, which Cali tends to be dry. Most uh, borax specimens will lose their water content uh, if they're stored in dry enough conditions and will start to become tincalconite. And a lot of tincalconite specimens are deliberately altered borax, derived from drying out borax. Chinese people in uh, the 10th century AD use this in ceramic glazes and it's actually still used in ceramics to this day to ensure a good fit between the glaze and the ceramic itself. Practically speaking, most importantly, this is a two on the most scale of hardness, so be exceedingly cautious when you're handling one of these specimens. But most, most importantly, it is a crafting material used by miners and goldsmiths in Final Fantasy XIV, so now you know. So for our closer look, I wanna take a look at this broken type because I think you guys have got to see the little needles down here at the front of the specimen. They are so shimmery and crazy blue-green color. So get in, get in here and let's take a closer look. This has been uh, Seven Gems and Minerals You May Have Never Heard Of. So let us know if you would like us to do another one of these uh, types of episodes. If you want to find out more about some gemstones you may have never heard of, head over to gemstones.com. Let me know what your favorite was down in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe, and of course, ring that bell so you don't miss out on the next time we tell you about Seven Gemstones You May Have Never Heard Of. Take it easy, we'll see you in the next one.